Eleanor did a book on the Smith film family during COVID. <laughs> she started and finished the book. By the time she did the presentation, the book was sitting in her hands. <laughs> By a donkey, Eleanor, that you are here tonight to talk to us. And thank you for everybody attending the meeting. We are looking forward to the presentation. I'm a storyteller. So I'm going to tell you the story of the sisters um, of Pinel. Um, the mission station in the Western Cape. Now, I want to start by telling you that um, I have always wanted to, uh, to listen to the stories of my family. And there's, my dad has got one sister, Auntie Madge, and she always told us the stories of the family. And you know, it was overwhelming to keep listening to her and not remembering what the names and the places were. So on one such occasion, I said, auntie, give me a pencil and page. And I started plotting it down on those big B five pages in the Furkan. Um, and then that is where I got bitten by this bug of genealogy. So, and it led, it became so bad that it led to, to me researching the Sister family. And then it went on to my other three families as well. So I've got it very high up in this tree of genealogy. I just keep on, it doesn't matter if it's night or day, I just keep on searching. So where does this family come from? This family, as uh, originated from slaves. So my Oma Sara and Opa Karel, they lived on Lekkerwein in the Groedrakenstein area. Sara, Sara's mom was Dorinda Pandeka. So Dorinda was born in the late 1700s and she was the finest of Villiers and she worked in the kitchen or in the house uh, of, of the slave owner. And when she was um, living on the farm, there were others too. I think about 18 other slaves that kept the farm work going. Who the father of the six children are is not recorded in any document, but of the six children, three um, died when they were very young. And um, Lot is the oldest, and then Sarah, and then Dina, um, emancipated in 1834. And in the book that we published in 2019 about the Seister family, um, you can see what the farm owner got uh, for them um, as a benefit to him um, after the emancipation. However, um, the slaves got nothing. They weren't paid out a lump sum. So they moved from the farm to the mission station um, with only the clothes on their back. And Sarah was already in a relationship with Carl and they had three children. Um, at, on the mission station, they were met by um, Domini of Irvarde Stegman. He was a young man, only 18 years old. And he then um, said, you have to behave well because here's a list of rules. And if you don't behave, we just, you know, ask you to leave the station. So of course, they had to be exemplary in their behavior. And um, after those three children were born, another, um, another eight were born. Uh, and they all were baptized in the Pineal Congregational Church. They went to school there. Um, and most of them married um, in, in, the, in the church. Of course, then when um, Sarah and Carol got to the station, they were not married, they were de facto. Um, and that meant that 
they already stayed together as a couple, but they had to be formally married. So you do get the marriage certificate in uh, the marriage uh, records uh, that you can see at the Kerk Archive on, in Stellenbosch. So that is a little bit about the, this background of the couple of Seister, where they get the surnames from, I don't know, because Karl was just Karl. Uh, he was born in the Cape, so he was then Karl van der Kaap. And um, Stara van der Kaap uh, was, so when they were in the mission station, um, they lived a life of independence. So they had the um, and the piece of land alongside the river where they had to plant vegetables and um, they could have livestock like pigs or bucks um, and the transport came a little bit later where they had a horse or a donkey. Um, and they could um, drive their vegetables and food for the winter and put it in the soil. Uh, this we know because there was a census taken 1849 where they came around and how many children, what they had, and the hold where this was recorded. Oldest child was Hendrik at the age of 12 years old. Um, and he then brought in money and everybody that worked on the farm was, uh, their income is recorded, but only Sarl and, 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 and his wife, there's no, recording of them working on the neighboring farms. The possibility is that they might have worked at the men's uh, of Stegman. Um, and the reason why I say this, because uh, the youngest child of Karel and Sara had the same name of Johannes Friedrich Stegman. And that is my great grandfather. So there we have the 11 children, all um, brought up very well in the, in the church, the school, Sunday school, and they started marrying off. And so now you had a problem for who they have to marry. They couldn't marry their sisters and brothers or other people. They could marry other people on the station. So this tradition then developed where people would say, ons trou ons eie gemors. Now that seems very harsh, but it only means that we marry people we know. So people from outside were frowned upon. They were not trusted because, you know, if they don't know you, they won't trust you. So they are called incomers. So a little bit about the incomers. The incomers, were people from other places and Jan Friedrich, um, uh, Johannes Friedrich is my great grandfather. He married somebody from Simondium. And so his parents were not happy. His son, Johannes Jacobus, married somebody from Cape Town and his parents weren't happy. My dad married somebody from Namekolan, the Kamisberger, and his mom wasn't happy. And so the tradition goes on. And when my dad had eight children, uh, everybody had to be happy because no one of the eight children, um, only seven got married, um, got married to Pineal people. So in our family branch, maybe called the Nkomer branch, because most of us, um, married people from outside. Now we come to the other tradition of marrying the nichis and the nifis. In my study, I could get a, 
a small percentage of, of intermarriaging taking place. This we knew because we all say this and that and Neaf and Anti. Those are the names we put in front of the people that's related to us. But how we are related was only known after my study. Um, I've got a joke of somebody, uh, not a joke, but something funny. When one of the field workers went out and had a session with me, she says, hey, I realized that I married my third cousin. Um, and she went home to go and tell her husband that they are on the intermarrying list. Okay, so all the, the, the darkness and all the uncertainty was then cleared away of how exactly we are related to each other. The other topic that I want to talk on is about the careers. Now, coming there as slaves, we knew uh, um, the, the earth. We knew how to make an existence of nothing and turn it into something, the house, um, building houses. And from there, we can see over the 10 generations of sisters, we have got doctors, we've got, um, uh, uh, you know, business people, we've got sport people, you know, just name it, there's a career that somebody is followed. And um, at some stage, there were like of a, of a family of eight, uh, seven would all be teachers. Um, and, and that was because the, the limited careers that people could choose at some stage of our history. Um, our family didn't only stay in Peniel. Some moved to other towns, neighboring towns, um, to neighboring countries, and also overseas. So you get sisters of this family. In Australia, you get them in Canada, you get in the UK, uh, New Zealand, just and the internet was, is, is a very good tool to bring the family together. Um, this last year, at the end of the year, we had the first sister reunion where we had five branches represented of the 11 branches um, of our family tree. And what a great sense of getting together and uh, being together it was. Um, we've got our own um, uh, logo of, of staying together and becoming a success. Um, and um, we would like to have another reunion this year. Um, the, the next thing that I'm going to talk is the impact of outside events. How did it impact? the family. Now, as I said, in the beginning, it was slavery that impacted our family. So they were set free. They had to work for themselves. Um, and the other thing was colonialism. So after colonialism and slavery went hand in hand, so they didn't have somebody to boss them around anymore. So they became landowners. They were house owners. Um, they worked for jobs that had an income. So a lot of, of things changed for the family. The other thing that also changed um, was during the wars. Were they going to take part in the war? Yes, of course. They registered they, uh, as voters with um, Irvade Stegman. Um, Karl and his, his five sons went to register in Paul. So they were <laughs> able to vote, but they were also able to fight um, in the wars they were asked to assist in. Um, then um, there is the apartheid, the big A. How did it impact pineal people? Um, 
the towns that we did our shopping was Pal and Stellenbosch and of course Cape Town. Um, the stories of those people must have been very scary. Um, and I can remember when I was young, my dad sent one of these sons up into a tree to hide the spades and um, the garden tools because uh, we were not allowed to have weapons in our possession. And that was in the time of unrest because we thought that, and we were scared that Pinel was killed as was the case in Stellenbosch where people were put out of the town and the same as in Pal too. So those fears were real fears. And I know my dad says they need to carry me out if they want to move me from my house. So yes, it impacted and in a different way then too um, about not taking part in politics at all because we had our own politics. In Pinel, we've got our own politics. Um, it was only after 1994 that the exercise of choosing um, your party and belonging to um, the different kinds of political structures in the country that we uh, could and we participated. However, before then, we had our own municipality. We were like a kind of Urania where we did our own thing. We had our own church, we had our own municipality, we had our own post office. We had our own, yes, we were a little country uh, on its own. Um, and when we go outside, then of course it's the big wide world and um, nothing phases anybody. So if you get to know a Pinial person, very confident. Um, and yes, uh, if we do go out of Pinial, you know, there's only one school, um, but you get many uh, of the, the teachers becoming principals on the outside and, and being very um, progressive in, in the work, world of work outside of Pal. Um, I want to conclude um, at the stage so that if there's any questions, then I can answer them. Um, from our humble beginnings as slaves, um, we got to know that we need to survive. Um, we need to survive, not only in feeding our families, but to be functional in a free world. And this story of hope is a story not of hope only, but also surviving against the odds. So if you pass our church and our museum and our verf on your way to Franju, do pop in because there's a wealth of history that is locked up in our town um, that we want to tell you all about. So thank you, Alta, for letting me speak on not only my town, but also my family. Good evening. Thank you very much for that. Um, I'm just curious, do you know the origins of the slaves, where the slaves came from? Because they, they brought people from all over, from India, from Malaysia, and, and whatever. Um, Patrick, I would like to answer you like this, is that the origins are big headache because if you look in the slave register, there's about so many carols that you don't know which carol to say, okay, I'm going to focus on. 
So they don't have a surname and therefore it is very difficult to attach a name um, or to a place or outside of South Africa. However, um, Opgave Rolle is there, um, but I have not yet found um, Karel's uh, parents or um, uh, Dorinda's parents, for that matter, where they come with a little boat across the, the ocean to come to the Cape. I haven't found that yet. I wish somebody can help me to make that connection. Okay, uh, I have seen where Thank you. slaves have been named. Uh, I can't remember what the first name was, but Sara von Bengal. So obviously this person came from Bengal. Uh, so you, you don't have that, that facility at this point. Yeah, Patrick. Patrick asked whether there's mention of um, places that they came from. There's a whole list of places that people came from and also, um, it, you know, being sold on the auctions and who bought the slaves. I get the registration of the slaves at Jacob Stefanus Sevilla. I do get that. But where they came from uh, would be Mozambique. But if it's from the car, um, you don't get the previous um, generation or the, the, the parents of that Panda Cup um, necessarily. Okay. Um, there's a question here in the chat for you. It is from yeah. Sandra. Uh, she says that her aunt married an after sister, and she was wondering if you've got an after in your family tree. Her aunt is Jessica Roberts. Yes, I, I found an Arthur Seister, although his name in the, in the register is not Arthur. I think he's John um, in, in some, some of the, the, the records that I, so she can contact me and then we can take it from there. Thank you, Sandra. And then, um, Eleanor, I suppose, uh, the sisters of a C and the sisters of the S, are they all related? Not necessarily so, Alta, because oh, the, the, the sisters of Pinel is C Y. Uh -huh. However, the, the officials documenting the death and the marriages, they just ask, what's your surname? And they spell it anyway. Mm. So a lot of C-E-Y would be there. There's also part of the family that changed their surname to C-I-J. Um, you could be on your death certificate be a S-Y-S. So um, if they don't know how to spell it, and sometimes the family member would be illiterate and not have a clue, you know, is it S or C? I don't know. I'm just called Seister. Mm. I have a, 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 a one of the members of the family um, he, in, the, in the Second World War. He went as a galley boy on a ship to, um, to just be on a ship and, and he's not eligible to to fight in the war, so he, he may be said he's, he's of age, but he left South Africa and he died in Klagenfurt um, in, in Switzerland. And on his tombstone, it is C-I-S-D-E-R. Uh, so that could also be a spelling because it also says Seister. Mm. Eleanor, you mentioned um, intermarriages, and in any small little town, that is what hap what's happening, and it's the safe way to find a partner and, you know, building the community um, sort of firmness or, um, yeah, gestand, you doen your gemeenskap gestand. Did you come across any illnesses that's running through, through the families, um, or um, how do you call it? 
that there's something that if if you know this comes three or four generations long the, and the inter then there's cancer or there's heart diseases or anything like that did you come across mm -hmm. that did you focus on that maybe in your studies um that these illnesses that just is sort of linked to this certain groups within Peniel, or can't you talk about that? Um, I had to sign an ethical letter and get permission from the family uh, to include this in my study. So I hope that, that it is for this talk too. Um, I went and I, I, as far back as the 1600s, I went to intermarriaging then and I found Darwin marrying his, his cousin um, uh, and having 50% of his family wiped out um, and the other 50% is brilliant. So that picture then showed me that both outcomes is possible, you know, sure. for intermarriaging. So um, I didn't do genetic studies. And, and that would be the, the option for generations to come. Let's look at it genetically. However, I took uh, two case studies and one of the case studies was done in my own branch where an uh, auntie married uh, a nephew and also both children um, were impacted on their health and the daughter died when she was nine months old and the son had Down syndrome. So, so whether it was age or whether it was genetics, I'm not 100% sure. But we do have people with um, uh, illnesses and retardation in uh, pineal. Uh, but I cannot emphatically say that um, it's because of the intermarriaging. That study still needs to be done. I found it very interesting. What I'd like to ask is how much of the research was based on what I would call traditional documentation? Um, how much was on family documentation, maybe Bibles? And how much was family law or verbal history? If I had to depend, and I'm going to try to answer it this way, if I had to, to, to depend on primary um, uh, resources only, I would not have gone very far because the family tree would not have been completed without oral, um, the oral resources. I had to go to families and ask, and I had many instances where they say, you know what? The oldest child of this family um, had another child that was raised by the grandparents. Now, that was a tradition. So it will be uh, um, appearing as that person is the youngest of the family instead of being the oldest of the mom and the dad. So that, um, if I didn't ask for that, I wouldn't get that uh, correctly documented if I didn't know that. So if you come from outside and you look in the baptism records and you see that Oma this and Oma that has baptized a child, you will not know whether it's a grandchild because you know the grandchild would have been baptized um, by the parents in the case of illegitimacy or um, in the case of uh, unmarried mums. I had to make use of, of the Cape archives, of the Stellenbosch archives, because um, the pineal documentation is for safekeeping there at the Stellenbosch Kerk Archiv. Um, and I had to get the permission of the church to see it. Um, and um, the people there, they so helpful. And they helped me such a lot. Um, and uh, I couldn't get almost 3,000 family members together if it wasn't for that. And to that, I, I praise them and I give them thanks every day because without them, I could not do it. Um, mm -hmm. They went and they got the birth, the deaths, the, the places where people were born and died. Mm -hmm. And they 
faded to me via the internet, via emails, and it was it was a big, big project. Um, and we as a sister family just pulled together to get the information as correctly as possible. Nigel, however, 2022 came and I started way in, you know, very long ago, more than 10 years. Somebody contacted me and said, you did not put our family on the tree. And that to me was such a big shock because then I discovered that Oma and Opa didn't have only 10 children, they had 11 children. And that's just a month ago that I realized this. Do you find the occupations as broad or do you find them in agriculture or largely on the railways or was there, is, is there a focus or was there a transition? Um, I, I also find social industry, the impact the indus, industrial age had on family history uh, quite interesting. And again, in the UK, the impact of railways, the canals, the uh, development of industrialization and cities. Did you find your family concentrates in certain occupations? Um, Nigel, during my talk, I alluded to the fact that the, the system that we had in South Africa limited the family to just do the careers of their choice, of their dreams. We were limited in just becoming policemen, teachers, nurses down at the factory of Rhodes Fruit Farm. The next very, um, uh, if you're not successful in your, in your studies, then you go and work on the farm. So um, everybody was warned against, you know, you're going to be a plus worker if you don't study. That was, we were told in school. So you don't want to end up that way. So you had um, this, but after um, the removal of, or the renewal of our legislation, um, it's then, you know, nobody wants to become a teacher now. Um, in my family, we are six teachers. And so we have got 21 grandchildren. Nobody wants to be a teacher because that's not a career they want to be in or a nurse, or a policeman. They go for maybe um, the more exotic ones, the more fashionable ones. And so um, that would be the trend, yes, of doing other careers than their parents. Eleanor, uh, one last question from me. How many families were there more or less of new? Um, we are still busy doing at the museum. Um, there was recorded uh, by an outside contractor about 15 families that they did the research on, but the genealogical side is not aggressively tackled because like the DeVette family would be part of the Seister family. The Williams family would be part of the Seister family. The mentor, you know, it's all interconnected. So if you're going to make a story of the biggest family or uh, what they are all interrelated in, in, so, in, in some way or other. If we've got the, the, the Williams family only, uh, they will be the biggest part of Pineal, then you have got the Stasters and then there's other families that's not related, but they marry into the family. And of course, then the bigger family swallows the smaller family. I want to thank um, Alta and her committee and all those listeners that came in to listen. Um, you know, if, if you want me to talk, then I talk. If it's my family, it's my family, I will talk anytime. So it was a great opportunity for me to just put the sister family out there. Um, and thank you for the questions. What I'm currently busy doing, my fourth family, is the Clutes. The Clutes is so big, mm. uh, then, then there's no end. 
So I'm very excited about the new book that's going to come out, but it's going to have a special format. 